Interstellar clouds are comprised of roughly 98% gas and 2% dust. What we call dust is actually heavier elements, sometimes referred to as metals. The gaseous constituents fall in the ratio of 7 hydrogen atoms for every 3 helium atoms. If an interstellar medium gives rise to the formation of stars, it will earn the title stellar nursery. Before stars form, the interstellar medium must first become extremely cold, around 10 to the 20 Kelvin. Regions of cloud can become colder than others when dust is found in higher abundance within these regions. The heavier elements that comprise the dust produce a cooling effect. As the heavier elements get jostled in these regions of cloud, their electrons absorb energy, jumping energy levels. Those electrons then lose that energy by emitting light at a specific wavelength, signatures of the original molecule. Photons escape the cloud taking energy with them, cooling things down. At these lower temperatures, the once ionised gas cloud will become molecular as the atoms bind together, forming molecular hydrogen and carbon monoxide. When these cloud regions become molecular, parts of the medium become more dense than others. This in turn causes irregular clumping, which leads to even higher density regions. Since the temperature of the cloud is so low, the internal energy of the molecules is low and collisions are infrequent. This manifests little outward pressure, allowing gravity to overcome any outward exertion, ultimately leading to a collapse. Appropriately named dark nebulae, these regions are opaque to visible light. Infrared and radio telescopes are used to identify these regions. As these regions become increasingly dense, the force of gravity exceeds the outward pressure. Their cores begin to collapse under their own gravity, a process known as gravitational contraction. The masses of these cores lie in the region of 10 to the power of 4 solar masses. The disparity in density between the cores and the outer region of cloud cause the core to collapse first, a requisite step to the fragmentation that later ensues. This fragmentation leaves behind the clumps that will go on to become protostars in a 10 million year long process. Clumps are roughly 0.1 parsecs in size and will have 10 to 50 solar masses. For perspective, it would take light almost half a year to travel their diameters. Once a clump has its own unique gravity, it can begin its process of becoming a protostar. During the next phase, the clump will undergo some dramatic changes. Loose gas surrounding the clump falls in dramatically increasing its mass. Gravitational contraction continues causing the clump to shrink and become more dense. The initial gravitational potential energy of the molecules endows them with kinetic energy as they fall inwards. As these particles collide, their kinetic energy gets converted into thermal energy. Since the number density n and the thermal temperature T within a gas cloud are directly proportional to the thermal pressure, the thermal pressure increases. This is shown by the equation P equals n times k times T, where k is the Boltzmann constant. However, since the clump shrinks, the force of gravity also increases. This is due to the average distances between molecules within the cloud decreasing as seen by the equation g times the whole of mass 1 times mass 2 divided by d squared, where g is a gravitational constant. As d decreases, the force of gravity therefore increases. The collapse continues so long as the force of gravity acting inwards exceeds the thermal pressure acting outwards. The clump undergoes other changes such as spinning. As its radius shrinks due to gravitational contraction, it rotates at greater and greater angular velocities. This increase in rotation rate occurs since angular momentum must be conserved. The clump consequently undergoes a flattening effect where it becomes a disk shape. This occurs due to the collisions between particles in a spinning cloud. These particles once moved in random directions but now have all merged into one direction resulting in a flattened rotating disk. This nebula disk will go on to become a planetary system. Once the temperature within the core reaches thousands of degrees, it becomes an infrared source. During the initial collapse, the clump is transparent to infrared radiation, but once the clump gets denser, it becomes more opaque. Infrared radiation can no longer escape and becomes trapped, adding further to the increase in temperature. The collapse slows as thermal pressure begins to rival the gravitational force. At this stage, a protostar is formed. A protostar cannot be called a star until its source of energy comes from thermonuclear fusion, 
not gravitational contraction. For thermonuclear fusion to take place, where four hydrogen atoms are fused forming one helium atom and energy, the temperature of the core must reach 10 million degrees Kelvin. As the rate of fusion increases, the energy produced within the core equals the energy radiated from the surface. At this moment, an equilibrium is reached and the star stops collapsing. The commencement of thermonuclear fusion illustrates the T-Tauri phase. Once a T-Tauri star begins thermonuclear fusion, a strong stellar wind forms along the axis of rotation, giving rise to a bipolar outflow detectable via radio telescopes. T-Tauri stars are notorious for having vigorous surface activity and irregular light curves. A T-Tauri star will be surrounded by a circumstellar disk, also known as an accretion disk. This structure is formed by diffuse material in orbital motion around the star, a ubiquitous feature of massive central bodies. These disks are opaque to visible light. Eventually, the accretion disk loses angular momentum as it gets closer to the central star, allowing it to orbit at a greater angular velocity. As the interface between the adjoining layers succumbs to massive amounts of friction, the gas comprising the disk heats up, converting its potential energy into heat. This process radiates energy in the form of infrared. Some of the accreted material gets ejected perpendicular to the disk plane, creating a high-energy stellar jet. Infalling material radiates optical and ultraviolet light. Once the circumstellar jet dissipates completely, a young star is left behind. A T Tauri star can lose half of its mass before it can be classified as a main sequence star. A young star starts off its life, becoming cooler, bluer and slightly fainter over time. 